races are coming back up and everyone's excited. I mean, there are some canceled here and there, but mostly all triathlon races are coming back up and everyone is getting back into the pool or, you know, getting on their bike, treadmill, outside running, everything. And for me, I do want to do well for my upcoming races. I have a 70.3 Bayshore, uh, which is located in Long Beach. And I also have another 70.3 in Indian Wells in December. So I don't really have too much time. So what I wanted to focus is trying to improve my swim time from two minutes to a minute 30. Now, I went up on the website coachup.com and tried to look for coaches and there were none. And I only found a couple that were available to do it, but they were too far. And I did find one person who will be down to do a virtual coaching. Now, the main question is, is virtual swim coach worth it? Hi. I got it. I have earbuds on. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Glad we finally figured out a time to do this. <laughs> I know. Seriously. So before we get started, can you um, introduce yourself like so I could, you know, know a little bit more information about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm Jasmine Toski. Um, I do private swim coaching right now in Los Angeles and a little bit overseas. So my swimming background includes um, swimming since I was teeny weeny, six year old to like a swim town. So at that point, I swam all of my like childhood into high school where I ended up being on the junior national team and national team. So then from there, I did well enough where um, I got riveted to go to USC uh, in Los Angeles and represented them as well as the national team during my time in college. So that's my swimming background. And since then, I've been the personal coaching like part-time has kind of turned into more full-time now that I can do some virtual stuff as well mm -hmm. as in-person things. So that's my background. And right now, yeah, the pandemic kind of flipped everything around, but I'm mostly situated in Los Angeles right now. Oh, you're in LA. I'm in LA too. So this is something like very new for me because usually when you're coaching, you always work with a coach like, you know, face to face. I guess this is kind of face to face because we are looking at each other, but it is still virtual. So I'm guessing there will be some limitation in like how we could like proceed forward. Just because I'm talking to you for the first time, like it's not like I'm going to get faster just because of this one time. Yeah, um, I think that's a lot of just experimentation at this point. I found that it does help more so with adults versus kids. <laughs> and with the adults, at least, like the back and forth feedback um, does help. Like sending videos um, whenever you can get them. Mm -hmm. If you have a friend that can record or yourself, then um, as immediate as I can, and I can send you that feedback uh, through just texting, through like a picture or like telling you like in a video call so i would say that would be kind of one of the best ways or most doable ways for virtual coaching what i have done was like facetime or zoom at the at the pool where i'm like on the screen <laughs> up uh, on the pool deck and watching now the wi-fi is not usually that great uh, but i can still tell like you know, the basic stuff and a little bit more of what the person needs to work on. So that has been the most beneficial for a virtual coach, which is like funny to think like I'd virtually be there coaching, <laughs> but that does help a lot. You do need to have a dedicated friend or parent to like walk along the pool deck with their iPad or phone. Mm. And, you know, every time the person touches and they bring the phone, me, to them and I talk to them right there. So... That has been the most beneficial, which has been interesting. Um, I've had parents that wanted to do that because they're desperate to like get their kid back on track. So uh, either way works, okay. but I've noticed that has anything that mimic the um, immediate feedback. I think that's what it is, the immediate feedback. Mm. But I found ways around it where at least I would give you notes. Mm -hmm. So every time you jump back in the pool, then you have those to refer to. You remember them. That's the that's the, usually the issue. Just remembering them in the pool. Okay, cause yeah, I mean, before meeting you, what we did was you asked me to record myself, and I had no idea what angle or how to record. So I just sent you uh, like an edited clip of here and there. 
so that you could see yes. it. Um, how was that? Was it somewhat useful or was it like... Oh, yes. No, that's all good. <laughs> and like you slowed it down too, which was not necessary, like easy peasy to see everything that was, I needed to. So mm-hmm. yeah, that works well. And I mean, I can definitely like walk you through everything. So my goal would be not to just tell you uh-huh. what you have to do, but for to help you understand what the goals are. That's really what I try to do and give you kind of some suggestions and clues to how you can help yourself to to catch yourself doing bad habits or notice the good habits. So like, for example, like what were the bad habits that I had for my swimming techniques? Yeah, well, I would say one of the first things would be I'm not staying long. So in swimming, as a swim coach, Mm -hmm. I always want to emphasize you want to be long. You want to reach forward and be tall in the water. That goes for all the strokes. For freestyle especially, you need to do that for the initial catch. And that's where your stroke comes into play. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that you're rotating, right, which is very necessary. You're rotating side to side. But the reaching forward with the arm, it's just at... I would say just a little bit of a reach. We won't want a full extension of the arm. Like you're really reaching to grab an apple from above. Now, when you do that, you want to stay straight. So it's the reaching, staying straight is the best thing that you want to do when you swim. So um, in the video, if I were to mimic you, you enter. Do you remember where you enter? Yeah, I think like more at the top of my head. Yes. So if you watch the video again, you enter at the top of your head. Then where does your hand go? Just right under me? Yeah. Sometimes it goes under. Sometimes Uh it goes to the side a little bit. So that's two things. From there, when it goes to the side, it wants to take the best pull that it can, right? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to swimming, that's the best place to do it. So when you swim, you want to extend and reach at the, there goes my arm, at the shoulder line, right? Just Uh right here. This is where you want your point of entry, right at the shoulder. And you pull down from there. You want to keep it very simple. When we start swimming like in an S shape, we get away from that line. Mm. So one of the hands that pulls, you know, goes into the head and then pulls to the side. That takes time to move the arm to the right position. So when you do the recovery stroke, you just want to enter right there. Just right enter at the shoulder line. Oh. Start the stroke from there. Okay. Yeah. So some drills I can suggest to you would be doing like a few 50s where first you would notice the stroke. Just notice your hands taking a pull, how much water each hand, each arm is getting. You might notice both arms are different. Maybe your left hand is more weak, especially if you're like right-handed. So also take a look at your own stroke to see like how you are pulling. So this goes into the second part. So you said you started pulling, like, sometimes at your head, right? Yeah. So experiment, right? If the idea is you want to pull straight down along the shoulder line, more or less, feel that. Feel what gives you the most pull. Because what will happen is you'll notice that pulling more on the outside will be harder because you're pulling more water. You have more water in your arm. Versus when you're pulling what we say um, across your body, you lose that. There's less of the initial catch. So, does that kind of make sense right now? Yes. Like, that's very interesting. Like, how come no one ever told me that? And, I, like, I watch all yeah. these YouTube videos and it looks like they're, you know, under their body. But when I was doing it, like, more like the shoulder width, like shoulder width wise, I could feel already a huge difference. No, oh, that's awesome. I mean, why don't we start off with, um, like what you know about swimming. Okay, well, I never actually learned swimming. So it was more like I just saw people swim and I just like, you know, do the same thing. Long time ago, I always thought, you know, like, oh, the hand, like you have to like make it into a cup shape. That's what I also was taught. So you could grab more water. And I was like, oh, that makes total sense. Like if your hand's flat, there's no water. But if you have a cup, you could grab more water. So that's how you used to swim. And they also told me like, if you want to go faster, you have to move your arm faster. Well, that's, I was like, that makes sense too. Like, so it's like an engine or a propeller. Like you gotta move it fast. So I think the far reach is something that I was told, but I just never thought it made sense. Cause I, instead of reaching far out and then like getting myself more tired, like why don't I just do a short reach faster? (laughs) 
<laughs> but it makes sense, right? It all makes sense. Yeah. Especially if you're learning. So, no, that's perfect that, like, you pick those up because, you know, that's why I think in the water you want to try out different things. So, for example, we'll go with the cupping, right? I've had plenty of people that have thought about the cupping as well, from adults to kids. And, you know, we think of that because we think of a ladle, right? We think of, like, a ladle. But, like, we're in the water. When you're, say, canoeing, is your paddle like cupped it's more flat there's a little round shape to it right but it's like flat yeah so we gotta think about it that way um we're not trying to like lift the water in the air we're trying to move the water in the water so yeah that's one thing that definitely you can try out in the water for yourself for your body to learn the difference you probably have the habit of cupping right now which is fine so maybe i can write this to you too for a drill to do is where you just do 25s alternating a 25 of your cupping with the hands and then alternating where they're flat and you just do that maybe like i don't know a few times through for your body to understand like okay this is a definite big difference right and i feel what's happening everything at first will be pretty like mechanical robotic but after a while it'll become more fluid it'll be easier to just like do it versus being a robot <laughs> Mm-hmm. Another question I had was, I know you are a uh, like a pool swimmer compared to like open water swimming because that's what I do. Is there any difference between the pool and open water? For training wise, what I've noticed is not really much of a difference if any. Mm-hmm. So at USC, we had some open water swimmers, um, Haley Anderson being one of them. I think she swam in Tokyo recently for like her second or third or something Olympics and like she would always train in the pool so we would see her doing like the hardest workouts in the pool and she would go open swim train like not very often Mm. not super often yeah so I mean that gave me the idea it's like you know it's really not only being in the element but just training the correct things and having that endurance built up so when it comes to the pool versus the ocean I do think you have to obviously like counteract the waves coming in yeah and that would be I would say maybe we'll do the only biggest difference from my perspective of this so when it comes to the open water swimming I would say like what we what you were saying you have to look up right you have to look up time to time and during that time you have to keep kicking that's what comes to my mind is when we pick up our head there our lower body kind of wants to stop so that's the point where you don't want to lose speed because every time you do that that would be awful if you like stop every single time so it's trying to be as efficient as possible and another thing that comes to mind too is just try to keep everything long like your body kind of wants to bring everything forward like on the stroke maybe that's okay but you have to maintain enough length to get that pull and obviously like things come to mind you don't want to look for too long right just yeah. a quick peep and back down okay yeah so what i also know for um open water swimming is the kicking mm. a lot of people tend to maybe overlook the kick because you guys have a lot of running and biking afterwards so you want to save the legs for that right yeah when it comes to swimming, the kicking is super important, whether you're in the pool or not. Um, not just to move you forward, but it's for your body to stay more up on top. Mm. So it's easier to swim on top of the water when you're like this versus dragging your yeah. legs, right? So yes. I think for the open water, that would be the main purpose, just to keep the body up. Um, so you can kind of you know save your energy as well. You're not fighting the water. So you're being just on top um for that you might not use it, your legs a lot during the race but during practice you really want to train them because you want to make it where when you're in the ocean doing your race it's easy peasy right and you're still staying on top of the water so i think it's still important to keep it in your training regimen to know how to do the kick really well and i mean that just means like spend like 10 minutes kicking on the board doing a set like that no, you don't have to you know, spend the whole time kicking for your training, but it's definitely something that you want to keep in mind just to keep your body more on top. Okay, truthfully, I do zero kicking training because <laughs> I hate kicking in the pool. I mean, I don't know why I hate it, but I just don't like it. Like, I hold the board and I try to do at least a 50 or even a 100 just kicking and I'm so slow that it takes maybe like two minutes just to go a 25. So mm-hmm. I feel like 
Why am I kicking? <laughs> <laughs> well, just because you're starting off. Yeah. You know, it's going to kind of feel like it sucks because we're, we start off and we're slow. But you just got to keep practicing it. Like, you know, probably the first time you were on a bike or running, probably thought, oh, my gosh, like, how am I going to go faster? But you just keep doing it. You keep doing it. Now, how you hold the board is another thing, too. Do you hold it where your body's kind of out of the water, your head's out of the water, holding the kickboard at the top, or do you hold the kickboard at the bottom and you have your head submerged in the water? I do hold it at the bottom, and then every time I breathe, I would, like, let go of this hand and then breathe and then grab it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I would say, yeah, so... Honestly, doing a drill like that will help with your upper body, the arms, and your legs. So one drill that I want to suggest before was doing a kick pull. That's like one name for it. Essentially, you will have the kickboard or not and extend your hand out. Oh, that's my arm again. And you're going to kind of kick on your side in that reaching position, right? When you're rotating. You're going to do eight kicks. One, two, three, four, eight kicks on one side. Then you use which sides you take a pull and then put in your other arm and reach and then you go into another eight kicks again so you count them mm -hmm. for every pull you do so eight kicks per pull now that will get you better with having a better rhythm okay um, because your arms are a little bit disjointed from the kick i definitely can tell that you don't kick too often or you don't want to and that's understandable mm -hmm. right and it's slower right we Kicking versus pulling slower. So if you do that, that will help out kind of connect the body as well. So the legs aren't acting as anchors as much as something that can help you stay afloat. Oh. Um, yeah. So that you want to think of it maybe like that way, how to keep your legs you know, being efficient but not working its hardest. Mm -hmm. So you can rely more on your arms, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for that drill, that will help you out seeing – um, keeping your arm reached out in the right position with or without the kickboard and kicking in that position because when we breathe, we have our arm reached out, right? And in the video, you, sh you might notice that when you breathe, your legs come apart. And that's pretty common. When we breathe and if our legs come apart, that means that we sort of come to a stop. We want to just keep kicking, a consistent kick. Okay. Yeah, as I talk about a lot of these things, yeah. um, I love to point out that when you're swimming, you can take a look at your stroke too. For example, the cupping of the arms or the hands. When you're swimming, you can look around and just turn your head a little bit to see, okay, my hands are cupped or they're open. You don't need a coach to tell you that, right? You can yeah. physically look, which a lot of people miss. Um, same thing with reaching. A lot of the times people don't know the difference between reaching here in front of the shoulder and the head. Like, I remember when I was trying to learn the difference, you would think, oh, I'm totally doing it right. But if you just lift your head up and look, you'll notice, oh, maybe it's really crossed over. Mm -hmm. This is an area where it's hard for the arm to learn. And, you know, by giving yourself um, you know, the ability to just look at your own show helps. That's why, like, you can have someone to tell you stuff too, but if you try to see your own stroke as you're doing it, it helps along the way. That's immediate feedback right there. Got it. Well, awesome. Like, there's so much information you just told me that I did remember most of them. And so I'm mm -hmm. good thing I recorded it so I can rewatch re it. Yeah, I mean. And if you have questions, you're welcome to send any to me. So I know this wasn't exactly straightforward with everything, um, just because this is more about um, triathlete stuff. But I hope at least these things help you understand versus just know what to do. It help you understand, like, we want to make it really simple. We want to make it really long. We want to use our legs. Yes. So. <laughs> okay. And, um, like, for example, I know the main reason why I reached out was because I didn't want to get faster in the swim. Because, like, cycling, I'm good. But in running, I'm okay. But in swimming, I'm, like, the worst. Like, I'm literally almost, like, the bottom 5% when it comes out of the water so by just like decreasing it by you know maybe 15 seconds for every 100 or even 20 yeah. 30 that would be like amazing so like 
Um, I guess I won't be able to fix it right away, but I'll definitely work on some of the techniques that you did tell me. For example, like getting long and then, you know, the reaching, uh, keep grabbing the water from shoulder and kicking more often. Um, and then I guess I would record myself and probably like by doing those kind of things, like how much faster would one per would one person get? I mean, for your example, right? I would say you should see things immediately. Like you already did, right? By yeah. pulling correctly. Now, next time when you go in the water, you are now going to look at your stroke and see, am I entering right at the shoulder line? Am I entering a little bit too close? That's already going to help you out. From there, it's just going to be able to hold that stroke and train that way. So really, that's just how often you get in the pool and you're able to train. When you do swim on your own, you're probably able to like think more about your stroke and what you're doing versus like doing laps and laps and laps on the trash. I would say that, no, I know it's hard to swim on your own, but if you find a buddy or someone that you can swim with, whether they do track lawn or not, that always is kind of something that can help you even get further to train a little bit harder. Mm. I only know a few friends that can really train on their own. And it can be tough too. But um, when you have someone there, you can kind of, you know, get a little bit more competitive. You can have a little bit more willpower to finish the set versus get out early or something, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I that mean, happens. It sounds also sounds <laughs> like like swimming is not as fun as maybe the biking, I bet, right? And mm -hmm. that's maybe in part two. Like you probably bike with a bunch of people, maybe not right now or so, but that's something that you know helps with your motivation. You see the scenery, you're out there in the fresh air. So with swimming, you got to create an environment that helps you feel motivated and ready to swim every time you jump in. Mm. So it's like, you know, run, going out on a run out in the open on a nice morning versus on the treadmill. You know, there's like a different mindset. So you want to think about that for swimming too. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I mean, there's a lot. I'm definitely going to try, you know, doing all the techniques that you told me. Um, and I'll kick more often and see the difference. And I guess, is there like a follow-up video that we could do? Um, for example, maybe like two weeks later or three weeks later, I'll record myself again and then we could go from there or what would you recommend? Yeah, yeah that works. Um, one thing that I just kind of started almost about to use, um, this one other company reached out to uh, have me be on their platform, you know, like coach up, they, you know, for the virtual coaching, they just give us our contact information. That, that's it. We figure it out. But with this other app, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, it's called daylight and daylight. Okay. you would submit a video and it looks like I can edit on it. So that's kind of oh. cool. So I'm going to try to look into that more part. I'm talking with the lady now, but that's something that maybe would help too. That might be a little bit better. Otherwise, I can be on deck next time with you virtually, and uh, we can do it that way. Okay. So, yeah. All right. I'll talk to you soon, and yeah. bye-bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too. All right, guys. So that was the end of the virtual meeting, and overall, I liked it. Like, I wasn't expecting what kind of meeting it will be or how the meeting will proceed, but overall, like, she's good like she caught on to like what I was doing and my mistakes in the pool and I love the feedback and like I said I already actually did a couple of the stuff um, like she showed me like for example not like putting my arm across like underneath my body but like outside with my shoulder width and I've noticed a significant difference like it's not like 30 second difference but I believe I was about 15 seconds faster than before. Uh, that's big for me. I mean, that's a win for sure. So I'm definitely gonna do what she said, maybe find out where my entry point is with my hand and also kick more often, practice my kicks. I hate my kicks, but practice it. So like I said, I'm gonna go to the pool at least three times a week for the next two weeks and then record myself on the second week and I send her the video and then we'll see if there's any difference or any other mistakes that I need to fix to get faster. Or maybe she could be on the deck 
with me. We'll see. If you guys like the video, please smash the like button, subscribe, and comment down below your mistakes and what you did to get faster in the pool. Alright guys, like I said, triathlon is a journey. So guys, always be happy and let's get training.